Today, I will be sharing about AIM Inclusive School Libraries, specifically connecting assistive tech and library staff to strengthen school library policies and practice. <laughs> so I am Casey Fernandez. I'm the district librarian for the Tiger 12 and School District. And you can contact me if you have any questions about this or any ideas for collaboration or any resources that may connect to what I share with you today. Um, so basically I have had a lot of, of great moments and success and progress working with AIM staff over the years and um, participating in a cohort and working with my assistive technicians in my building. And so my purpose today is to share some of that work in case it's helpful to other people and to gather more ideas for ongoing collaboration. And the goal of this collaboration is to increase student access and ease of use with accessible educational materials. So the three topics I'll talk to you today is first, um, how to connect school staff, um, school assistive tech staff with library professionals. Then I will talk about exploring, developing, and sharing accessible educational resources and collectively and promoting them to students and staff. And finally, I'll talk about reviewing library technology and resource policies and um, how to suggest revisions um, if you needed to include AEM. And we did that for Tiger 12 and for some of our library policies. And we are now working on it for a responsible use of technology policy. So we're continuing this work. So first I'm gonna talk a little bit of how we connected and what a good in is for this kind of things. It can be kind of um, a challenge to connect sometimes AIM professionals with library staff because there are times when our roles overlap and we do see each other, but there's also a lot of times when we may not see each other often, especially if the AIM professional does not go through the library. We're usually pretty stuck in the same place. And also some of our district staff can be hard to find. So my first tip is to connect and reach out. If you haven't talked to your librarian, or if you haven't talked to your assistive technician, reach out and try to connect with each other because both of the individuals in those roles tend to be very passionate about book access and getting materials for students. And it is just another tool in our toolbox when librarians learn about tools that they can connect students with. We are already always seeking out resources. And so any resource that assistive tech professionals can share with school librarians is going to be well received. And I have always received them openly. And every time I share them with my library staff, they're excited to learn a new tool that can help their team become more inclusive. And that is something that we are working on over the years. So if you work at the district level and you're not in building, or if you're in a different organization, sometimes it might feel um, challenging, or you might not even know who your district library leads are. There actually are a network of us, and um, it does depend on the website of how easy it e is to find the contact for the specific individual in the district. But I do have some tips in case you look at the website and you can't find. So first, you could look through district websites for library services or library resources. And hopefully that will provide you with the information that you need. But if that doesn't work, you can also ask a neighboring library lead. So if you're in the Portland metro area, we do have a PLC and we all work together and we share ideas like this. So I will be sharing this presentation and I do share AIM resources in my cohort and we know each other pretty well. But there are, even with um, connections with the different library leads in the Southern Oregon as well. And for that, our Oregon School Library Liaison, who at this time is Jen Maurer, has a network of all of the library staff, both at the district level and in building across Oregon. So she can contact all of them at any time. So 
She is a wonderful contact if you are asking or curious about a specific school or district. So once you do connect, um, where should the conversation start? So I'm going to share a little story about where I began this partnership. Um, my first introduction to AIM was actually due to a consistent request for audio narrated books. So we have, um, over the years, increased demand for audio narrated books. And I started um, by working with Jamie Meyer, who at the time was one of our assistive technologies um, specialists, to actually go and reach out and see how I could help a student with dyslexia. I wasn't aware of Bookshare at the time. I had heard of the term, but I had never helped anybody become connected. And this student, their only disability was dyslexia, but it had not been officially diagnosed by their doctor because they didn't understand or know the value of that. So what was really neat is our assistive technology specialist actually told me to see if the parent would be interested in going through the diagnosis process formally. And they did. And now that student does have access to Bookshare for the rest of their life. And that was very helpful for the family because the student was going to participate in the Oregon Battle of the Books. And so I do acquire at least one copy of each audiobook, but um, each audiobook costs between $45 and $60. Sometimes you can get a deal at $35, but as you can imagine, especially with the budgets that we have in our schools, it really adds up. And so anytime we can alleviate a student that is able to use a different tool, that helps a lot. And that was such an impactful moment for that family and an empowering moment for that student that it really um, got me more interested in learning about more accessible tools that I could use with my students. And um, I now was, thank you, thanks to Bruce Alter and another assistive tech for my district, I'm able to actually was connect with him and I got a demo about Bookshare and now I can go in and I can see exactly how the portal functions, how students can access it on their devices and how it actually works in real time and see the collection for myself. And that has been so helpful as it makes it very easy for me to help pair our community with these resources. Um, and it, do, it isn't every day that our students need help connecting with books on Bookshare, but it does pop up multiple times through the year. And even last week, I was helping um, a student who has had Bookshare for a while get access to the house on Mango Street. So now I'm able to help in those different situations really go in and see what it is on the ground, know what it sounds like. And so different demos of in-person and video tutorials and sharing those is so helpful because it when we get more in-depth on the ground knowledge of how these tools work, that can really help librarians connect the tools that are accessible to our students. And once you understand how Bookshare works and everybody who's involved um, now knows what the tool is and how it can be useful for students, kind of a fun next level is to start thinking about book lists and recommendations for the students who qualify for Bookshare. Some of our students who qualify for Bookshare don't have exactly the same library experience as everybody else. So they we do have them visit the school library, but they don't always, they if they cannot just pick a book off the shelf and read it, then th sometimes they need a different version of curation. And so one thing that has been really powerful and interesting has been to learn about the students' interests 
and try to connect them with the book. So one that we did last year was we learned about a student who was very interested in wrestling. And so I researched different books that that student might be interested in exploring on Bookshare for their specific assignment of um, independent reading and novel study. So a lot of times our students do have to select their own books for a class assignment, and it's not part of adopted curriculum. It's a supplemental resource that the teacher wants everybody to select their own materials in this helps align with our intellectual freedom goals of the student kind of customizing their education. So it's very helpful for differentiation, but sometimes our students who need extra reading support don't get access to that. So suggesting books that they can actually go in and use for those types of projects and silent reading in school is super helpful. And the student was very appreciative of the options that they had. And there is just such an extensive list of titles available in there. It has been so helpful. Another thing that librarians and AIM technicians can partner on is making choice boards. So here's an example of a choice board that I made for Native American Heritage Month. And so in, if you create a choice board um, and then you can link videos that promote each title to the choice board and the student can actually explore those titles and see if they might be interested in any of that content. And it helps them um, get to know new books, whether or not they can actually make it into the library or whether or not um, they can actually experience print books. They can still get a taste of a wide variety of literature um, digitally. And that helps promote our digital resources as well. These are actually linked to Sora where I do have audiobooks and books in Spanish as well. The next thing I'd like to talk about today is how exploring, developing, and sharing AIM resources collectively and then working together to promote them to students and staff. This is an ongoing effort and it does take a lot of push, but um, there are so many resources out there that are already curated. And sometimes you don't even have to build a new resource. You can just look through what is already available. Um, I know that the AIM cohort has a ton of material available that would be relevant to school libraries and um, my assistive tech team regularly shares videos. And I have shared one recently with my library staff that they've really enjoyed. And so I'll talk more about that later. Um, part of sharing tools available for accessible educational materials that align with school library practices is spreading the nose about UPAR. So one thing, um, this is one tutorial that Bruce has shared with me and I have connected our literacy coaches and specialists with the UPAR between um, our collaboration. And we have one of our district literacy TOSAs actually was able to give the UPAR assessment to new students last year who came in and did not yet have an IEP or a diagnosis, but immediately had a reading ability that was grade levels below, and they were able to qualify within a few weeks. And so when they went in and completed that, then that is actually the student that we matched the wrestling books to. And it is amazing at the speed of access that this new tool allows. Um, and I am just so thankful that anybody can now administer it after they connect with their district administrator because that has helped us test more students. And so one, the case of that student was a student who had not been with us in the district for years and had come from another state and had very little information in their file. 
And so this was able to us give them that tool at middle school when they um, could have benefited from it before. But I think it's just so neat that we're able to connect these students, no matter if they've been with us from kindergarten or if they come in middle school or if they come in high school, at any point we can help them get access to Bookshare using UPAR. Um, the next tool that we have shared with library staff and has been very well received is Kami. So Bruce created a Kami tutorial that I shared with library staff and we practiced using it in a library meeting. I gave a demo as well. And um, Kami's text narration and markup tools can turn any PDF into a read aloud text that is able to be marked up and it works so well with both iOS devices and Chromebooks. And in our district, we have iPads in K-8 and Chromebooks for high school. And so having this Kami tool available has been so incredibly helpful because Anytime we create PDFs and give them to students, they can immediately have them read aloud in Kami, and then they can also mark up on it. And so now I try to encourage library staff to favor PDFs over other formats, though we do have read and write for Google Chrome documents, and I have shared information about that too. So here is an example of the similar accommodations we have shared throughout our district. And for this specific info sheet, I partnered with instructional coaches. And they are another person that in the schools that are wonderful to connect with, to share AIM resources with. So this is IO specific, but we are able to create these info sheets to, so that more students are aware of the tools that are already built into their device. So there are so many, we noticed there were a lot of students who had, might notice the microphone on the keyboard of their iPad, but they didn't know that they can use that to type with their voice. Similarly, we have the speech selection tool um, that pops up when searching in Safari and a lot of people and students in our district were unaware that they can use that to have different websites and files read aloud. So that's good when it's not in PDF format, they can easily use that. And then same thing with Safari Reader. Um, so immediately gets rid of ads and that has been a huge tool because it helps redirect the attention of students. So the Safari Reader button has been one of the favorite universal accommodations that we can offer to our students among both library staff, coaches, and teachers. Another thing that we do, I've learned to do through taking different um, accessibility type of professional developments is to evaluate my library resources website with the WAVE accessibility tool. But I also understand that the addition to this, um, we need to go and actually test it in real time. So WAVE will actually, I can put my library website URL in and I can have WAVE evaluate it to let me know if I forgot to add alternate text to any images on my library resource website. And it will also let me know if the contrast is not accurate or if it's the contrast is too low so students cannot easily read the text on my website. Um, and that has been so helpful. And then um, both the AIM cohort and my assistive technicians in my district helped so that I could not only do the evaluation, but take it to the next level and actually try it out on our devices. So that is one thing that I noticed that is a crucial piece of this is that not only do we need to evaluate it using tools like this, we also need to then go and try a student device 
of a student that has an accommodation and see if it works as expected when we're trying to have it read aloud. And that has been super helpful for me as well. And in case you're curious, this is what TTSD's library resources website looks like. It's 121library.org. And we have a lot of research databases here. So another thing that we do is test the tools built into the research databases to see if it is acceptable for students. So they do have um, read aloud capabilities in many of them, such as the Gale resource project, um, resource databases that we use for academic research, PK to 12, as well as we have World Book Online. And so I'm able to test those on my computer, but also have to go in and test them on student devices to make sure that they work as expected. The last thing I'm gonna talk about today is to review library policies and suggest revisions if needed to include AIM. We have found um, that it is very helpful to include a wide variety of people in your policy development and revision to ensure that all of the cross department needs are accounted for. But one thing I do want to talk about is why focusing on policies can be helpful. So if you are in building, you might not think of policies every day. I think about them more because I am at the district level. But our policies actually provide us with talking points to encourage best practices throughout the district. So if somebody at the district level is knowledgeable about the policies and a situation arises in which they could use some reinforcement, the policies provide reinforcement and talking points so that we can reintroduce those best practices and provide reasoning behind why we want to make sure that accessible educational materials are considered in the instructional selection process as we're looking for core adopted and supplemental materials that we will use in our schools. It really helps us dive deep and find different ways that we can actually utilize these in building. And it just kind of cuts arguments to the point where there's less wishy-washiness regarding decisions and it makes it easier to make a decision. I really, really lean on the fact that it strengthens the position of individuals attempting to reinforce best practices because there are a lot of things that happen on a day-to-day -day basis in our buildings. And so sometimes you need more than just a suggestion or a reminder and citing policies can really help defend your position. Also, it provides guidance to our administrators who are managing the activities and processes outlined in the policy so that they don't overlook important considerations because they might be thinking about their siloed work and what their area of expertise is, and they may not be considering accessible educational materials, and they may not be considering library practice. So that is another reason why having strong district policies is so important. And being a school librarian, I cite our instructional materials selection and procurement policy on the regular, especially when we have book challenges. And so, which happens more frequently recently in years, it ebbs and flows over the years, but it is so important to have those available, to have those conversations in a constructive way. And it really does help relay that information in a more positive and firm manner. It helps us be warm demanders.
If you've never adjusted a policy before, it can feel like a daunting task because it is a legally binding document and it can be intimidating for some people. But I do want everybody to know that there is so much help out there for it. There is the option of hiring legal counsel, but if your district does not have the funding for that, it is completely possible to do it and your role as a library staff member or to encourage people at the district level to start working on it. So you can provide suggestions to policies, even if you're not the one who can actually change the policy. And right now, um, even unions can suggest changes and revisions to policy. So our staff members can even reach out to their union members for support. Um, so here are some of the state and nationwide consultants that have helped me as we were doing the AIM portion of our revision for the library and classroom and adopted materials selection policy. I connected with representatives from the Oregon Department of Education and representatives from CAST. Though they cannot provide legal counsel and are not legally bound to the suggestions they provide, they can really help select the correct verbiage, which is incredibly important because we are not going to be experts in every single field. And myself as a librarian and people in my field, it is part of our duty to collect knowledge but I have found that it is the most wise to reach out to other people who know more about the specific topic at hand and connect with them. And then I am not guessing at what the correct word or term may be. I'm actually able to use what is commonly used. And there are agreed definitions on many of the statewide and nationwide organizations. Um, and there's another policy we're working on now where we're using definitions provided from the White House. And I'll share a little bit more information about that later. But there is just so many professionals out there that are eager to support and help schools. And I am, I don't know if I've been lucky, but I have not received rejections. I've only received support. So I have just been overwhelmed and thankful for the support of people helping us create the best policy we can have for our students. So I'm going to talk a little bit about the material selection and procurement policy that I've been mentioning. I do have a link to it here. If anybody would like to go into it, it is posted in the policy portal for our district and all of the districts around us. Um, and what we've decided to add after consulting with the state and nationwide reps is language that ensures that assistive technicians are consulted throughout the curriculum adoption and a reminder that AIM must be accessible by students who need it at the same time the new adopted material is available to all other students. And we also included the definition of accessible educational materials and I love that addition because I am able to use that definition as a tool to have these conversations in buildings and reinforce the importance of these conversations. And lastly, if you are able to get all of this moving and in motion, a next step that is so important is to continue collaboration. And I find that by this helps develop relationships where you are able to find different students that you're able to also continue connecting these resources to and different educators that you're able to promote these resources to. And so the last thing I'm going to talk about is our next collaboration. So currently, TTSD library and assistive technicians are working on a tentative responsible use of technology policy to protect generative AI use. 
And if you are curious about our committee work, I have a link to our slides from our October and our November meetings. And it does include a link to our tentative responsible use of technology and academic integrity policies. And you may um, not be able to see them, but if you would like to see the draft, I can allow specific individuals to see it if it is applied directly to their work. Um, and if you are somebody that has a common working relationship with Tiger Tweledon, but it will be, once it's adopted, it will be publicly available similar to our selection and procurement policy. And we are working together to not only develop this tentative policy, but to also provide professional development to our community regarding artificial intelligence and how it can be used in the classroom to support individuals that have diagnosed and undiagnosed challenges and disabilities. And one thing that is so amazing about being on this committee is just seeing the rapid development of the technology and um, seeing how Bruce and others are able to use it with for themselves and with their students. And I am also just happen to be very passionate about sci-fi and artificial intelligence. So it is one of my favorite committees that we're currently working on. <laughs> and there's just so much potential of how this specific technology can be used with students. And one thing we are including in our tentative policy is a protection so that students who are allowed to use AI per their IEP um, are able to use it for any assignment as long as um, even if it does not align with the teacher's directives for that assignment. And that will actually allow us to go in and Gener and help those students provide generate ideas and content that they were unable to generate before. So it will give them a chance to submit more assignments than they were previously able to. And this is all tentative, but it is very exciting and it is wonderful work to continue. And it just has really reminded me how much school library work and positions can overlap with assistive technology, especially when the school librarian supports STEAM initiatives and technology. And many of us do. And some of us, including myself, actually um, have taught technology and are trying to encourage STEAM throughout the learning environment and create casual opportunities for students and staff to experience it. So I really do think that AI is going to be a universal accommodation that will help so many students. And we're just waiting um, to try to get our policy in line so that we can actually try this out with them. And um, that is the last portion that I have to share today. So I wanted to thank you all for coming. I do see we have quite a bit in the chat um, that I have not responded to. And there's a lot of tools and resources that were shared in the chat that I am also interested in that connect with what I have shared today. So I just wanna say thank you with for that. And does anybody have anything they'd like to um, share or contribute or resources that connect with what I shared today that you'd like to share?
You are free to unmute yourself or to type in the chat box. Uh, Casey, I, the information that you have included, I've always known that librarians had a lot of, um, a lot of potential as partners. And I, I, I'm just thrilled that you have developed that. And of course, Bruce Alter is known across the state and now across the country for his work. We're thankful that he's part of our team. But I, as I hear you talk about some of these ideas that I haven't really thought about before, it just reminds me of how important it is for people to reach out uh, to their librarians when they are looking at solutions for accessibility. Awesome. Thank you, Deb. And yeah, we are um, tend to be resource hounds and just love to collect anything that we can provide to our students. So the fact that I think that is kind of a common um, trend through both AIM positions and school library positions is we're all trying to connect students with resources that they enjoy and that can help them with their personal and educational growth. Awesome. And I, you mentioned Jen Marrer being the person for the state. Yes. Um, who is with ODE and librarians. And uh, I've been in contact with Jen and with Tina Roberts, both at ODE. Uh, you, Casey, have been part of our AIM cohort and working along with Bruce in this, uh, in this passionate work for some time. But it's really nice to know that those folks at ODE uh, want to be part of our conversations and bringing them as partners to our table. So uh, the folks over school librarian and English uh, learners, uh, and that may be known as something different all over the place, but English learners, uh, that also falls under their purview. So just thinking about all of the different populations who, uh, when we ensure that our materials are accessible, it just meets so many needs and uh, provides that support up front without having to go back and, and retrofit. Absolutely. And Jen Maurer is an excellent resource. If anybody needs to adjust their material selection and procurement policy, she is meticulous and wonderful with grammar and is willing to help any district that needs help with that. She's been so helpful. So I am very thankful for her position and I hope she stays forever. <laughs> we also work on um, our OSLIS group together. So we also promote research materials and we are creating videos, more videos for OSLIS. Um, but research is a whole nother thing that we haven't even partnered about yet. So I'm sure that is something that could be explored later down the road. I see a question. Um, could you explain a little bit about how AI provides educational benefits to students? And it's a new development to talk more about. Yes, I. Um, one thing that I recommend is first just exploring it to see how it helps you. And then um, using that similar benefits with students. One of my most favorite focuses or uses of it currently is the idea of using AI as a think pair share partner. And I actually got that idea first from the book AI for Educators by Matt Miller, which I recommend. I have four copies in our Sora ebook collection. And he actually combs through different educators using AI regularly in their classroom and has collected all of those ideas. But my district has a focus on oracy this year. And so we were able to um, connect that in the sense where even if our students cannot yet use AI on their devices, which is something we are working through with this policy and through this process because of the cop the data privacy agreements that we need to have in place and are currently not in place, um, we are looking at creative ways. However, we can have staff use it and present it and as a thought partner. So what a AI think pair share would look like is the teacher would present a question. And the students would discuss their answers together in partners or trios. 
And then you would also, the teacher would type the question into the chat, review it, and then share it. And then the students can actually think if their responses aligned with the AI's responses. And so they get to interact with AI in a safe manner and they get to practice oracy with each other and also using artificial intelligence as a thought partner. So that is one of uh, the most useful tools for most as a gateway is using AI as a thought partner. And I love using it for book recommendations. So you can't know every single book in your library, but you can actually describe the type of materials that a student has enjoyed in the past. And it will develop a significant list, both Bing Chat and Chat GPT. And we also have Canva for my district. And Canva has a magic write tool in it that will also generate text. So educators can use that tool for free without having to sign into anything else. And um, you can, youth cannot access the magic write, even though they also have access to Canva, but they can use magic media to generate images that are copyright free for their slideshow presentations and for any of the work that they're doing in class. And so there is so many ways that it can be an support for our students, but those are just a few of the ways that I have used them recently and have been very excited about. Um, I really love using it to generate pictures of creatures reading and use them in library displays. <laughs> so more recently I've done a space cat reading, a uh, snowman reading, and they look so realistic. The cats look like actual cats reading books. <laughs> and so you can use it for winter reading displays to get students excited about that. Um, and the fact that it gen they can actually explore with typing in text to generate an image in Canva currently with the permissions that we have because we have a data privacy agreement on file with Canva is so exciting. Um, so that is one way that the students can actually interact with AI on their own. Um, and I do think that the thought partner and angle of AI is going to be most likely the initial biggest benefit for our students, especially because we have a lot of students and adults, to be honest, that have just a lot of issues beginning a task. And so it can help get over that hump and shorten the amount of procrastination. So using it to draft outlines is for research is fantastic. Um, you can even use it as an initial search because it will, similar to Wikipedia, where I wouldn't recommend it for your final bibliography, but we can now cite it. And as a source in a MLA format has a guide for it. It is just so incredible. And in my role, I have actually used it to draft scripts for instructional videos. One thing that has, that can be a huge barrier or a hump where you're like, where do I even start? Especially if it's a complex issue. So we have um, used it even with one of my statewide groups as a script for an instructional video that we're developing and as the draft. And then we do a lot of heavy editing. We never use what it initially spits out, but it helps expedite that process so quickly. And I think that is what we will find it is extremely useful for. Oh, and now another thing you can do is if there's publicly available data, you can actually upload it to chat GPT-4 and have it create charts for you. And it just keeps getting better and better every day. It's insane how it is accelerating. 
it makes it a little confusing to know is it really a, your work um, and so or is it chat GPT and so those are some of the challenges that we have to deal with and in being able to verify that as we go along um, but I'm so glad that you all are, are taking the lead and stepping out front and developing practices doesn't surprise me with Bruce on your team um, mm -hmm. but we are going to look to you and see all the great work that you're doing um, and how you are leading actually leading not just the state but some of the uh, practices across the country.